Welcome to the Apostolic Hour. My name is Apostle Terry Dunn, and I'm coming to you live from high atop the Mountain of God at the Mountain of God Tabernacle, located in beautiful downtown Mont Eagle, Tennessee. Our church address is 331 King Street at the corner of King and Fourth, where we hold Sunday worship services at 11 a.m. and 6 p.m., and our Friday night Shabbat service at 7 p.m. As the overseer of the Mountain of God Tabernacle, I want to personally invite you to come worship with us. We are a spirit-filled, full gospel, five-fold ministry church with a vision to fulfill the Great Commission as commanded by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, as you probably can hear in the background, today's worship service has already begun. So without further delay, let's join the Mount of God Tabernacle congregation as they listen to the anointed music of praise and worship leader Paul Dietrich, followed by an apostolic teaching of God's Word. We now join the Mountain of God Tabernacle ministry team as they spread the gospel of Christ by television, radio, and internet throughout the world in the dispensation of apostolic, prophetic, healing, deliverance, evangelistic, and messianic ministries. Good morning. My name is Apostle Terry Dunn, and I want to welcome those who have just joined us by internet. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and while you're turning there, I want to ask a question for those who are in the sanctuary. How many of y'all know uh, Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Raise your hand. See, that's everybody in here. So I would normally not preach a salvation message because I know these people, I know they're saved. However, this morning, that's what I'm going to preach, the salvation message. Just in case there's someone watching by internet that isn't saved, or someone who thinks they're saved because someone told them they're saved, but they're really not, or someone who may be saved, but they're not sure of their salvation. Now, the reason I'm preaching this message is because when I was 10 years old, I got saved in a certain denominational church by being led through a salvation prayer, but at the age of 44, when I had my near-death experience and my heart stopped, I went to hell. So I guess my salvation didn't take. <laughs> I can laugh about it now, but it's a very serious thing then. Therefore, it's my belief that there's others out there like myself who've been told they're saved when in reality they're not. Now, when I first got into ministry, started studying for the ministry and so forth, you, you, I started out of salvation. I mean, everybody really starts out of salvation. That's all salvation is, is, is the start. That means you're, you, you're in the kingdom, and now there's requirements God requires of you as one of his kingdom servants. But I started out at salvation when I first got into ministry, and eventually I went full circle back around to salvation. I mean, I went through deliverance, healing, prophetic ministry, apostolic ministry, and and much more, and I, I came back around to salvation. But the second time I saw it differently than the first time because certain Bible verses stuck out and caught my eye. And from that point on, I believed the Bible more than I believed what some preacher told me about my salvation or about salvation, period. Now, three of these verses that I'm talking about are as follows, and I'll quote them for you. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's Philippians 2.12. 1 
Make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, ye shall never fall. That's 2 Peter 1.10. And Luke 12.5, which says, Fear him, that's God, fear him which after he has killed has power to cast you into hell. In other words, we can fall from grace, and if we do, then God may have to cast us into hell, and that's his word. Now, I can't go against his word. I can only tell you what it says. Now, if you don't want to believe it, that's up to you. Now, that's why we have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And that's why we have to make our calling and election absolutely sure. So reading in 1 Corinthians 12, let's look at verse 27. I'm only going to read a couple verses here. Now, this might be a little bit of a long message, but it's got a lot in it. And I tried to shorten it, and the Lord just wouldn't let me. 1 Corinthians 12, look at verse 27. Now, he's talking to the church here, because he's talking to the church in Corinthians, or Corinth, through the Corinthians. So therefore, he's talking to us. Now, ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. See, all y'all are members in particular, those that are in the church. And God has set some of the church first apostles. That word first is the Greek word proton. It means first in place, rank, and order. First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. Now this is the governmental anointings of the church. Then it goes on to say after that, you would think would be pastors and evangelists or something. No. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversity of tongues. So it appears that the quote members of, in particular, that are in the church don't include pastors and evangelists. Now, for a confirmation of this, that pastors and evangelists are not in the church among the members in particular, turn to Acts chapter 13, and I'll give you just a second or two to get there. When I preach salvation messages, they are apostolic salvation messages. They're not just your typical salvation message. Because when you get at the word apostolic in there, it means it's deep and it's spirit-led and it's prophetic. So Acts chapter we're 13, I believe I said. Yeah, look at verse 1. Now this is the church in Antioch, which is supposed to be the model of the church as a whole. See, there's a lot of churches that... They're not modeled by what, uh, what's modeled in the Bible. I mean, they're, they're the out of order church. I won't go into church history and tell you how that happened, but I can say the devil was involved in it. And I can say certain denominations were involved in it, Catholicism and others. Look at uh, verse 1, Acts 13, 1. Now there were in the church that was in Antioch certain prophets and teachers. Only prophets and teachers, he said. Barnabas, uh, such as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Menium, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Now Saul's an apostle, the apostle Paul. So what we see in this church is prophets, teachers, and apostles. Again, we do not see evangelists and pastors. It says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. What's ministering to the Lord? That's praise and worship to the Lord. That's ministering to the Lord. It has nothing to do with uh, us. I mean, there's times when you minister to each other. But if you're in a church and all they do is minister to each other, they don't minister to at all, uh, and they're not ministering to the Lord, then you should look at it. You should say, well, it ain't quite scriptural. We've got to correct something here. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said. Now, how did the Holy Ghost say? Through prophetic ministry. So you should look at this and say, wow, the Holy Ghost ain't speaking to none of us. Something's missing. Prophetic ministry. That's what's missing. And the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work. What work? Apostolic work. For the work whereunto I have called them. That's God. That's the Holy Spirit calling them into apostolic work. Separate them. Send them out. And, of course, we know what Paul, the Apostle Paul and Barnabas did. They start building churches. Verse 3, and when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, that's another doctrine that the churches should look at and say, wait a minute, they laid their hands, we don't do that. Oh, we don't go do, do that laying on hands stuff. I'm sorry, it's scriptural. And when they had laid their hands on them, 
they sent them away. Sent means apostolically sent. That's what the word sent means. So it appears the pastor and evangelist were not in the first century church at all. At least not in the church in Antioch. And I don't know of them being in the church in Jerusalem either. And that's the church in Antioch supposed to be our model. Now, even though pastors and evangelists weren't in the church, they were still a part of the five-fold ministry. So turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And I'll show you the one and only time that pastors and evangelists are mentioned in the New Testament, unlike apostles, prophets, and teachers who are mentioned numerous times. Now, I'm not here to pastor bash. I'm just going to show you something about the church, and you will understand why we are like we are. I'm talking about the Mountain of God Tabernacle. We're apostolically governed. We have prophetic ministry. We do healing. We do deliverance. We do have intercessors. It goes on and on. Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 11. And he, the he is Jesus. And Jesus gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, there they're mentioned, and some pastors, pastors are mentioned, and teachers. Now, that's the fivefold ministry. Now, why did he give the fivefold ministry? It goes on to say for the perfecting or equipping of the saints. Certain translations say equipping of the saints, and that's a better translation. For the equipping of the saints. Now, why are they going to equip the saints? For the work of the ministry. What work and what ministry? Apostolic work and the ministry is Christ's ministry. In other words, he gave the fivefold ministry to train up the saints so they would carry Jesus' ministry. They do the work of the ministry. He didn't give them so that they would honor their denomination and, and, and oh, we, we do this and we do that. We, he, God doesn't care about that. He cares about you being trained up for the work of his ministry. He says, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, the body of Christ as a whole isn't edified as much as it should be, and that's because the church as a whole uh, doesn't really carry Jesus' ministry because that's the ministry he's talking about. It's the ministry that edifies the body of Christ. So according to these three passages of Scripture that we just read, pastors and evangelists were never in the church, per se. But they were a part of the fivefold ministry. Now, this passage of Scripture we just read, it doesn't say the fivefold ministry was given to the church. It says it was given to the saints, which means some of it could and was outside the church. And that some I'll show you in Scripture as we go on was pastors and evangelists. So the question can now be asked, if they, pastors and evangelists, weren't in the church, then where were they? Now, for the answer to this question, I could ask you to turn in your Bibles to the place where Jesus gave us the sinner's prayer, except for one fact, he never gave us the sinner's prayer. <laughs> and if he would have given us a sinner's prayer, now he gave us prayer, but he didn't give us a sinner's prayer, he would have surely modeled it for us like he modeled healing, deliverance, raising people from the dead, signs, wonders, miracles, and so forth. And the reason he never gave us a sinner's prayer or modeled one for us is because he knew it wouldn't save us. Y'all stay with me on this now. However, if he would have given us a sinner's prayer, he would have also shown us how to give an altar call, which he did not because he never gave an altar call. And because he never gave an altar call, there was no need for a sinner's prayer, especially since the prayer alone would not save us. Also, there was no sinner's prayer given because he, God, may have known that it would be used wrongly. In other words, it would be used as a way by which to count converts whether they were really saved or not. And by that I'm referring to evangelists and pastors who would use it as a means by which to justify the existence of their ministry when the reality is that their ministry was never supposed to be the ministry that got people saved. And let me explain that. 
As evangelists who were not in the church, they were only supposed to funnel the sinners into the church so that they, the sinners, could be taught the truth and make their own decision for themselves concerning their eternal salvation. In other words, you're not saved necessarily until you've made your own personal decision for Christ by having a per personal relationship with him as your Lord and Savior, period. I mean, you don't get to heaven by just going through a prayer. I didn't. You'll get to camp. I went to camp for that church. But when I died, I went to hell. Now, while these, while these people who were being funneled, the sinners, being funneled into the church by the evangelists who were not in the church, were in the process of making their own decision for Christ, they were supposed to be spiritually guarded, I'm talking about the sinners, spiritually guarded by the pastors, or shepherds, that's another term for pastors. So they're supposed to be spiritually guarded by the pastors or shepherds of the flock who were also not in the church, and they were supposed to be protected against the lie that the enemy wanted to teach them before they made their decision to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. In other words, like David, the shepherd boy, who went to the sheep rather than the sheep coming to him, these pastors are supposed to be outside the church guarding the sheep while they're being driven into the church. Now, one of the lies, I'll just give you a couple of them, the devil wants to give the sheep before they make their commitment to Christ is the doctrine of unconditional eternal security. Y'all probably know it better as once saved, always saved. It's a lie of the devil, and my near-death experience is proof of that lie. Of course, that denomination that propagates this lie, and there's more than one, but I'm speaking to the one that I was uh, attending as a 10-year-old. That denomination that propagates that lie would say that I was never saved in the first place. And my answer to that, or my question is, then why did you tell me I was saved? Hmm. In other words, don't tell me I'm saved if I'm not. The problem is they didn't know I wasn't saved because they don't know the true scriptures. They don't understand what, uh, what the model is for the church. And we're going to cover some of that in a moment. Turn to 1 John chapter 3. That's way in the back near Revelations. 1 John chapter 3. And I'll show you another lie concerning salvation that the devil puts out. And he puts it out through a, through a huge, huge uh, denomination. Now, I'm not against denominations as a whole per se, well, see, what God is doing, and I'll explain that in a moment, I understand now more about apostolic ministry. Apostolic ministry is a ministry that's to correct the church. And how do you correct the church? You give them the Word of God. I don't call and condemn them. I don't judge them. I'm not the judge. I can't tell them they're going to hell or not. That's between them and God. But I can tell them what the Word says. Now, if they don't want to believe it, that's fine. That's up to them. That's apostolic ministry. That's why all these seats are not filled. If we wanted to water down the gospel and just tell them whatever they want to hear, man, these seats would be full. We'd be overflowing. We'd have to get a new building. And what would we have? Probably 90% of the people that would not be saved. But you tell them the truth, you got 100% that's saved. Everyone here raised their hand when I said they asked them if they knew the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know you personally, so I know you know him. I've seen your fruit. 1 John 3. Look at verse 4. 1 John 3, verse 4. Whosoever committed a sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now we know that. And we know that he was manifested, that's Jesus, to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. And we know that. Verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Stop. Now, there's a denomination that takes that one little phrase right there and says, because I, I'm saved, I can't sin anymore, no matter what I do. It's a license for them to go out, commit adultery, fornicate, whatever they do, and say, I can't sin. It's not held accountable to me as sin. And they, these people that do that, take advantage of that rather than read on. Let's read on. 
whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. In other words, they're sinning because they really weren't saved. And they've been told they're saved. And so they think that when they sin, it's okay because it won't, they won't be held accountable for it. Now, that is also a reference to Matthew 7, 23. I won't read it to you. I'll just kind of tell you about it. That's where these people come to Jesus and said, Lord, Lord, we did this in your name. We did that. We cast out demons and we did uh, uh, great things. And he says, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. You ever wonder who those people are? They're the people that have their own ministry. They didn't have Jesus' ministry. They're the people that have their own uh, structure of the church. They didn't have the structure Jesus modeled for us or the structure the Apostle Paul modeled for us, the structure of the Antioch church. Depart from me. I never knew you. In other words, you never carried my ministry. I don't know whose ministry you're carrying. If it ain't mine, who would it be? It's either yours or the devil, and it's probably both. Look at 7. 1 John uh, 3, 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. Now, he's not saying let the, uh, don't let the devil deceive you. He's saying no man. So what's he saying? The church. Man in the church. Let no man deceive you. See, that's, that's a deception that this denomination teaches that. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he, that's Jesus, is righteous. Then look at 8, plain, King James English. He that committeth sin is of the devil, period. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God is manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Number 9. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Oh, see, I don't, I'm born of God. I can go out and do all these things, and it's not, it's not sin. What a lie. He says, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. Oh, see, I can't sin. No matter if I go out and commit adultery or whatever, I can't sin. It says that. Because he is born again. That is a lie. The seed is planted in the person's spirit. In other words, the spirit can't sin, but the soul, which is their mind, will, and emotions can sin. That's why we have to renew our minds. Otherwise, it'll uh, send us right into unrighteousness with God. Now look at verse 10. In this the children of God are manifest, righteousness, and the children of the devil, unrighteousness, sin, iniquity. Whosoever does not righteousness is not of God. Plain old King James English. Neither he that loveth his brother. So if you live by the Spirit, <coughs> excuse me, which has the seed, then you're a child of God. But if you live by the flesh that sins and keeps on sinning, and especially if you make an excuse for the sin by saying the Bible said I can do it, then you're a child of the devil. Some of us are <laughs> married to children of the devil. I'm sorry. I, I'm kind of laughing, but I think about it. You know, some of us are truly serving God and our spouse is busy doing other things. I don't know what they're doing. I won't even get into that. Now, that's why Romans 8, 14 says, and I'll quote it. We all know it. As many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Period. So according to this entire passage of Scripture, as opposed to just one part of it or one line, we're saved by knowing Jesus and accepting his righteousness and by refusing to continue living in sin. That's what it says. Now the safety net in all this is that if you do know Jesus personally, you know, you're saved, you know him as your Lord and Savior, and you do fall in sin, because we all have, then you can ask immediate forgiveness according to 1 John 1, 8 and 9, which says, and I'll quote it to you, if we say that we have no sin, that's the person I just told you about. Oh, I'm saved, so that's not considered sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If the truth is not in you, then what's in you? The lie. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
Now, getting back to the first century church, which is supposed to be our model for the church, the church as a whole, it was during that period of time that the sinners would be funneled into the church or were funneled into the church that they would be under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And it was during that same time while they were making their decision for Christ, the great numbers were saved. Acts 2.41 and Acts 4.4 says that 3,000 souls a day were saved. A day, not just one day, but per day. Uh, it also says that 5,000 souls a day were saved. See, God's plan, that was his plan to take the world. Have the church taken the world for Christ? Not at all. Because the church has got away from God's plan that he knew would totally work. 5,000 a day? 35,000 in a week? Now, this didn't happen <clears throat> that way because evangelists and pastors were leading them through the sinner's prayer. It was because apostles and apostolic teams were teaching them the truth about salvation. Turn to Acts chapter 6 and I'll show it to you. Acts chapter 6. <clears throat> now, when you start showing truth, you, you show people the truth and you show them the scriptures. Some of them still don't want to believe it. Let me give you a hint about apostolic ministry. As an apostle, I don't care <laughs> because I don't work for you. Now, I really care as far as I'd rather see you believe what the Word of God says. I'd rather see you get saved. I'd rather see you serving the king rather than the devil. But if you don't want to believe it, I can't force you to. So I don't get all tied up with, oh, they don't believe me. I believe it. It's his, God, it's his word. I mean, it was Smith Wigglesworth, I believe, said, what did he say? God said it, said it. I believe it. That settles it. <laughs> That's what he said. And this is the man that raised, I think, 19 people from the dead. God said it. That settles it. And I believe it. Hmm. Acts chapter 6. Look at verse 1. Now, this is the church in Jerusalem, by the way. And in those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. What's happening there is they distribute food to the widows. And the Hebrew widows are getting more food than the Greek widows. And that's what the complaint is. Verse 2, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them. Notice that. They called the disciples, the apostles, the heads of the church unto them. They didn't say, well, we need to form a committee and get this and let's all, let's all decide what color the carpet should be. No, you know why they went to the apostles? Because the apostles went to God. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should lead the word of God and serve tables. So he's talking about serving tables, feeding the hungry, the widows. Verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. What they're doing is they are appointing waiters. That's what they're doing. They're appointing people to wait tables to feed these people. Look at verse 4. But we, the apostles, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Now, why would they do that? Because they knew that prayer tells them what to do in their church and the ministry of the word is what gets people saved. In other words, we're not going to neglect that to have a covered dish need, uh, dinner all the time. Maybe a little facetious here because I'm not against covered dish dinners because I've eaten over in Miss Ruby's house and she used to bring uh, are you going to bring us any Thanksgiving dinner this year? <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is that what they're saying is that we can't leave this because this is what uh, God has required of us. Then look at verse 5. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, that's the Antioch church, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Now, why did they lay hands on them? Because they were anointing them. And more than that, they were 
ordaining them. And what they're doing is they are ordaining pastors to wait tables. <laughs> That's what they're doing. Look at verse 7. And the word of God increased. Why? Because they stuck with it. They didn't get off in rabbit trails. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. So it wasn't the pastors or evangelists, for that matter, that were winning the lost, because they were busy waiting tables, folks. Now, a pastor tells you those are deacons, because a pastor really doesn't want to accept that there could be somebody above him, an apostle. But these are apostles speaking. The apostles appointed pastors to wait tables. Now, they weren't winning the loss because they were bu busy waiting these tables. It was the ministry of the word that was being taught by the apostles that was doing it, that was winning the lost. So the way the so-called modern church does it today isn't at all scriptural. Now, I'm not naive to think that this message, even though it's going over the internet, is going to change the structure of all these churches. And I went to God about that. Why am I preaching that stuff? Well, it ain't going to matter. They're still going to want to do whatever they want to do, whatever their hierarchy tells them. They're not going to listen to you in the Word, and he knows that. He's not surprised by it. And I'll tell you in a moment his answer. Now, the modern church isn't doing it correctly or scriptural, and that's why even Billy Graham admitted that only about 4 to 6 percent of the thousands that come to his altar call calls are really saved. The rest fall by the wayside like in the parable of the sower. That's also why Jesus said you'll know them by their fruit. In other words, if they're truly saved, you'll see a drastic change in their life. That's what Paul meant when he said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. If you're in Christ, you'll be a new creature. If you're not in Christ, you're going to still be that same old creature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Then it says, old things are passed away and all things become new. In other words, if a person doesn't appear to be a new person in Christ, then they're not really saved, period. Why would he say you'll know by the fruit if that's not the case? Now, this verse about being a new creature in Christ, and I've heard people use that wrongly, it doesn't apply until the sinner becomes truly saved. And it doesn't happen through a formatted sinner's prayer or by, as one denomination falsely teaches, through water baptism. Instead, it happens through the true conviction of seeing the truth of the gospel, hearing the truth of the gospel, and by understanding the truth of the gospel. In other words, if a convert falls by the wayside, it's because they were never grounded in truth. And especially in these last days, apostolic truth. And I'll show you more about that in a moment. Now, what the hierarchy of the church today does is they expect the non-scriptural church that's led by pastors and in some cases evangelists to get every, everyone saved so they'll be taught milk for the rest of their lives while sitting on the pews for 20 or 30 years just to financially support them. Catholic Church is the richest, I think, institution in the world. Maybe the queen in England might be the only one that's richer, if any of them are. And all this is done in the name of Jesus with total disregard for the truth of what the scriptures really say about all this. Turn into Matthew chapter 5, and I'll show you how Jesus, the great apostle, did it. This would be the model coming up. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5. Now, this is the Sermon on the Mount. A lot of people think the Sermon on the Mount is just the Beatitudes, <clears throat> or it's just chapter Five, Matthew 5, but it's not. It's Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, and it goes on into 8, 9, even 10. And now we're going to go through all those chapters, but I'm just going to highlight things. If I read all that, we'd be here for two days. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he, that's Jesus, went up into the mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened up his mouth and taught them, 
saying. Now, he taught them. He didn't open his eyes, well, we're going to have a, an altar call. He didn't do that. He didn't. He taught them. Now, what did he teach them? Then we got the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there's the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And it goes on and on, the Beatitudes. Then in verse 13, he tells them, you are salt, the salt of the earth. 14, you're the light of the earth. Then down around 17, he teaches them about the law. He says, I, I came not to destroy the law or the prophets, but I came to fulfill the law. Then uh, verse 20, he says, except your righteousness exceeds that righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case, in no case, enter into the kingdom of heaven. There's going to be a lot of people that are heading up churches that are really modern-day Pharisees. In no case are they going into the kingdom of heaven. That's what he's saying. Then he teaches on anger, about verse 22, I think it is. He says, if you're angry with your brother, you've already murdered him in the spirit realm. Teaches about adultery. If you lust after a woman, you've already committed adultery with her in the spirit realm. Then in verse 31, he talks about divorce. 33, he talks about oaths. He says, not, uh, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it's God's throne. <clears throat> then 38, he talks about retaliation. If a man slaps your cheek, give him the other cheek. Verse 43, he says, love your enemies. That's chapter 5 right there. That's how fast we're going to go through them. Then in chapter 6, which is still part of the Sermon on the Mount, he tells them the proper way to give, almsgiving. Uh, he says you give in secret and the Father will uh, reward you openly. In other words, you don't give out of pride and you're not uh, boisterous about it. Then uh, he starts teaching them about prayer in uh, Matthew 6, 5. And that's where we get the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy earth will, uh, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and so forth. Then he talks in 16, he's talking about fasting. Then around 19, he says, lay up your treasures in heaven where they won't rust and moths can't eat them. And then in 22, he says, the light uh, that enters your eye, uh, your body, it comes through your eye, it knows your eye gates. He says, if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. So that means you got to watch what you view and see. And then in verse 24, he says, you can, you can not serve God and mammon. That's Satan's economy at the same time. And then let's go on over to verse 33. This is where he says, seek ye first the kingdom, and all these things will be added unto you. And that's 6, chapter 6. Now look at chapter 7. He starts out with judge not that ye be, be not judged. He says, in other words, it's, it's all right to judge a person. But before you judge him, you better take that plank or beam out of your own eye before you pull it out of their eye or accuse them. That's what he's really saying. And then in verse 7, we're in 7-7. Uh, seven, seven. He says, you know, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you'll find it. Knock and the door shall be opened. In other words, ask for help. Then in 13, he talks about the, 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 the wide gate of destruction and the narrow gate. He says, um, the broad gate. Lead us to destruction, and many there be which go in their act. Many. Many people are going to hell. According to the scripture, there's more people going to hell than there are going to heaven. But then he says, the straight gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So you got many going to hell and few going to heaven. This is Jesus speaking. Then he tells them, uh, every tree bears fruit, and you'll know them by their fruit. If they're a good tree, they'll have good fruit. If they're an evil tree, they'll have rotten fruit. And then in verse uh, 23, we're in 723. This is where they come to him and say, Lord, we did all these things in your name, great things. And then he says, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. So these are ministers of the gospel, folks. And then uh, he, he tells us to build our life pretty much upon the rock and not on the sand. And he gives a demonstration there of, so a man who builds his house on the sand and the water washes it away. Verse 29, I'll read that one. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. In other words, he taught them as apostolically. He taught them apostolically, but not like the Pharisees, the scribes, the church leaders of his day did. Now, that's the, uh, pretty much what people would call the uh, Sermon on the Mount. But after he teaches all this, 
He models it. Look at verse, uh, chapter 8. Let's, let's skip through this uh, quick. First of all, he's modeling everything he teaches. He heals leprosy right in front of people. He's modeling it. He's saying this is what you're going to be called to do, and I'll show you that in a moment. He heals leprosy. Then he heals the centurion's servant. That's in uh, verse 5. Verse 14, he heals mother, uh, Peter's mother-in-law. Then in verse 28, he uh, delivers the demoniac. That's the one that had the legion of demons. That's 8, 28. That's pretty much some of the things he did in that chapter. Then in 9, we're going to go to chapter 9, he heals a crippled man. He talks about fasting. In uh, verse 18, he raises Jairus' daughter from the dead. Verse 27, he heals two blind men. In 32, he heals a, a, a mute. And then we're up to Matthew chapter 10. Now, after he teaches all that, and after he models it, he then trains others to do it. Look at uh, Matthew 10, verse 1. And when he, that's Jesus, had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Then he goes on and, and names them. But skip on down to uh, verse 7, Matthew 10, 7. And then he says, and as you go, because I've, he says, I've, I've taught you this, and then I modeled it to you, now it's time for you to do it. As you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and cast out devils. Now, the word devils is in the King James, but I got 25 translations at home where it says demons. So he's saying, really, cast out demons and devils. And then he says, freely ye have received, freely give. In other words, I've taught you this, I've modeled it to you, and now I've let you learn how to do it. Now you've got to teach it, model it, and let, and, uh, let others do it free. That means you shouldn't be charging at your conferences, your deliverance conferences. People want to make a donation because you've got bills to pay when you throw a conference, sure, but you should not be charging. That's what Jesus said. Now, how can you be a Christian and be a follower of Jesus and not really read what he wanted you to do? You're in dangerous territory. Oh, Lord, I didn't know you said that. Well, why don't you read the book? Well, you really didn't mean that, did you? Yes, I did. Dr. Eby, the medical doctor who died and went to heaven, had all these questions, and Jesus kept telling him, didn't you read my book? He'd ask the question, didn't you read my book? That's all. Didn't you read my book? And he realized when he came back, he hadn't read his book, but he sure started reading it. So we can see that through all this that I just gave you, these many chapters, Jesus never once gave an altar call. He never led anyone through a, quote, salvation prayer, and he never asked anyone to join his church. Hmm. Instead, he taught the kingdom, modeled the kingdom, and then released others into kingdom work. His whole plan of salvation was to model the kingdom to the human race so they could make their salvation decisions for themselves. Now, that's what Joshua meant when he said, choose this day whom you will serve. Remember, he says, for as far as me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, the word Joshua is, means Jesus. Joshua in Hebrew and Jesus, I think, in Greek. Now, after the sinner who is funneled into the church by the evangelists and guarded by the pastors is converted, then they're so supposed to be delivered, trained up, and then apostolically sent out to repeat the whole process all over again. And that's what we read in Acts chapter 13. Remember the Holy Spirit said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work I've called them to do. In other words, you're not supposed to come and sit on these pews forever. We don't have pews. That's why I took them out, I think. The Lord told me to. Now let me give you some examples. If a new convert is called to be an apostle, and see, you know that if you're a prophetic church, God will give you his, his, the person's giftings. So if a new convert's called to be an apostle, then, uh, then they were supposed to be trained up and sent out to set up churches like the Antioch model. 
which consisted of apostles, prophets, and teachers whose responsibility was to train up others under the guardianship of pastors while the evangelists were out funneling in the new group of convicted sinners into the church. Now say they were called to be a prophet. And again, um, I, I, see when I, I give prophecy, I'll tell, I see everybody's gifts. And most people don't move in them, even when I tell them. You got a gift of healing. They don't go out and pray for anybody. If they did, the people get healed. You got a gift of deliverance. They run from a demon. One time I asked them, I said, Lord, how come I, I, every time I just see their, this is when I was an early apostle. I said, how come all I see is their gifts? He said, because you're an apostle and you're a prophet, and that's what you're supposed to see, and you're supposed to tell them. Whether they move in them or not is up to them. So suppose you, you're a convert and you're called to be a prophet or a teacher. Then they're supposed to be trained up to be in the church right alongside the, uh, the apostles as part of the governing body. In other words, to teach the apostolic truth. Meanwhile, those who were called to say be pastors and evangelists, because I'm not bashing these people, they're to remain outside the church as part of the funneling process of the sinners coming into the church. Now, I can understand, or I had no problem understanding why evangelists were called to be outside the church walls, funneling people into the church. And you know, a lot of churches have to oh, we got an evangelist speaking, and the whole congregation to be saved. That evangelist shouldn't even, if he's a true evangelist, he shouldn't even be in that church. He should be out there preaching on the street corner. You know the reason Billy Graham's ministry was so successful? He took a box and stood on the corner when he was 20 years old and just preached to people going by, and God said, I'll honor him. Then he ends up preaching to millions. So I can understand why the evangelists were called to be outside the church, funneling the people in or the sinners. But I did not, didn't understand why pastors were not a part of the governing body within the church. So I asked the Lord, and he led me to Jeremiah chapter 23. I'll turn the Old Testament. Now, this model I'm giving to you comes directly out of, the, out of, God, of God's word. Like I said, it's going to sound strange to some of y'all because you, you've been sitting under pastors for years. Now, I, I'm not saying leave your church. Seek God. He may tell you, get out and get in somewhere where they, you'll be trained. Because I know people, let me explain something to you. Let me explain the five G's. I don't know if I ever put this over the internet. Five G's. All right, five G's. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The fivefold ministry, five G's. Apostles govern. Prophets, they guide. Evangelists, they gather. Let's see, we got teachers, prophets. Let's see, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors. Pastors, they guard. And teachers, they ground in the word. So, if you got a pastor, all he can raise up is another pastor. That's why you go to these churches where pastors are in charge and they got you know, the senior pastor and the regular pastor and the youth pastor, and I'm not, nothing wrong with having pastors, but that's all they can raise up. Pastors generally can't raise up prophets because they don't even understand prophets. Some of them don't even like prophets. Some of them don't even believe in prophecy and prophets. Now, prophets can't raise up pastors. All prophets can raise up is other prophets generally, and I've known many of them in my day. And evangelists generally can teach somebody how to evangelize, but they can't teach somebody how to be a prophet or an apostle. Teachers generally raise up other teachers. That's why you'll have a, a teacher, an assistant teacher, and, and so forth. You know. But I'll tell you, apostles can raise them all up. Hmm. How can apostles raise them all up when the others can't? Because apostles are wired to read God's word and give it to you. See, I don't have to know how to I don't have to know how to be a saint evangelist, though I have been and I do, have done. Or I don't have to know how to be a pastor, and I've done that as well. All I have to know is what God says about it. And if he, through the prophetic, shows me you're to be a pastor, then I just tell you what pastors are supposed to do. Or evangelists. Or prophets. Now, we're in Jeremiah chapter 23. Look at verse 1. This is God speaking. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture saith the Lord. Now, pastures refer to being outside the church. There's no pasture in here. Pasture, outside the church. 
He says, therefore, thus saith the Lord, God of Israel, against the pastors that what? Feed my people. Remember in Acts chapter 6? They ordained pastors to feed the people. Wait tables. To feed my sheep or my people. Now he's talking probably spiritual food, but the same thing applies. He says, ye have scattered the flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Now, visited them refers to visitation. That's outside the church. Uh, the, in Acts chapter 6 where we read where they appointed these pastors to feed the hungry, they were fed outside the church. They did not have a fellowship hall in their synagogue. I'm sorry, they did not. So they were outside the church. They would go to their homes, I guess, or they'd all meet under a tree somewhere and, 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 and feed them. And he says, and you have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. You know what the evils of their doings are? Some of them, not all of them. Some of them's going to stand there and say, oh, Lord, Lord, but we, we had a church and we had it in your name. It's called the church of this or church of that or whatever. And he's going to depart from me. I never knew you. Hmm. That's what he's talking about. So according to this passage of scriptures, pastors were never supposed to be in the church. They were supposed to be out in God's pasture. Where's that? That's out in there. That's out in the field. That's out in the mission field. It's outside the church walls, just like David the shepherd boy was. Now let me say this about that. The last and final revival before the Lord returns to set up his millennial kingdom will not be a pastoral or evangelistic event as much as it will be an apostolic event. The reason is that apostles will teach the truth of the kingdom just like Jesus the great apostle did. That's what you're hearing. That's, uh, that's what people like, uh, people like, uh, what's his name, Reinhard Bunke. That's what he does because he's an apostle. Apostle means he was sent. He was sent to Africa. I mean, to save millions. That's not an evangelistic event that's going on over in Africa when he was there. I think he's... He's got somebody else trained up to, to go over there now, and he's in the United States. But that wasn't an evangelistic event. That was an apostolic event. How do I know this? Because he cast out demons. Because he got people saved. Because he raised people from the dead. I have yet to see an evangelist raise somebody from the dead. I have yet to see an evangelist that I know of. There might be some out there that has cast out demons. But I've seen apostles and apostolic people who can move in those gifts whenever God needs it. Reinhardt Bunke would be a great example. Now, to be fair about all this, I'll have to say that in the past, some evangelists and pastors did the best they could with the knowledge they had, especially since apostles and prophets were no longer in the church. But now that God is restoring the five-fold ministry with apostles and prophets back in the church, God's original plan from the beginning before Satan walked into the church and took it over, Revelations uh, 213, I think it is. Uh, that's the plan that's going to be used to win the lost. The sinner's prayer, per se, will not be the criteria by which people think they're saved. It'll be judged totally on their relationship with the king and what they do for his kingdom. See, we have a lot of people, they come, oh, you should be out there. We got, we got 50 souls saved. And I go, Hmm, Lord ain't told me to be out there. See, they're counting the prayer. We, we led people through a prayer. I've seen people, when I went out one time with them, I've seen people come up and just pray the prayer just to get you out of their face. Are they saved? Definitely not. So you can't come back and say, oh, we got 50 souls saved. No, you led 50 people through a prayer and, and I hope that a few of them really meant it. And a few of them then will seek out how to live for God and will continue their salvation. Now, for a closing, um, before closing, turn to Matthew chapter 13. We're getting close to closing. And I'll show you what Jesus uh, says about people being saved. See, he's the model. The church needs to listen to him and him only. And the Apostle Paul who listened to Jesus. Remember, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. In other words, Paul carried Jesus' ministry. Anything you learn from Paul was Jesus taught him. Even though he wasn't among the inner circle, the original 12, the Apostle Paul, in the Spirit, was given Jesus' ministry. Matthew 13, I believe it said, verse 15. One, one, one verse, Jesus speaking. 
For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. Many people here on the mountain, folks. And their eyes they have closed. Oh, we just when we've been doing this for hundreds of years, we ain't gonna change now, even if the Bible does say it's wrong. Hmm. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be what? Converted. He's talking salvation. And then, then I should heal them. Heal them means I'll make them whole. So what he's saying here is that people become truly saved only after they've seen the gospel, heard the gospel, uh, and understood the gospel, which has nothing to do with a cognitive salvation prayer, but has everything to do with their heart. Now, you could lead somebody through a salvation prayer. I've done it myself. And if they truly mean it, and then you give them God's word, then uh, they're saved. But a lot of times I've led them through the prayers and then I see them next time and they're still in the bars and clubs and living like a heathen. I'm sorry, they're not saved. It's sad, and you know some of them. We, we brought them over here from a local restaurant. But it's everything to do with the heart. Now, that's why the Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Fear what? Fear of the Lord. Fear that he'll cast you into hell if you're not uh, righteous with him. Trembling. You better be afraid. I've been to hell. I trembled a lot, let me tell you. I never trembled like I trembled in that experience ever in my life. Then it also says, make your calling and election sure. In other words, it's commanded to us to do it. Our decision for Christ cannot be truly made until we've seen the gospel, heard the gospel, and understood the truth. And in these last days, the only ministry you'll get the full truth and nothing but the truth from is apostolic ministry. And that's because apostolic ministry is the ministry that's being set up for the millennial kingdom. Did you hear what I said? Now, I'm going to explain to you what the Lord shared with me. The reason we're not full, I won't water down the gospel. I won't change a single word. I'm sorry. I'll preach what the Spirit tells me to preach, and you're not going to get anything else. You cannot change this ministry. No matter how you try, people have tried. They come and say, oh, you need to, oh, if you need to do that. And I mean, they mean well. And some of, some of the suggestions are, are pretty good. I'm not saying they're bad. It's, I'm talking about the people who want to change the ministry. We had one lady who wanted to change the name, name of the, the church. You didn't, he told me to name it. You, you know, you don't even count in this thing. So what I'm trying to say is this ministry will not change. And, and it will stay the same even if I have to close the doors and God takes it elsewhere. I'm sorry. See, I'm not going to struggle to keep the door because I'm not a slave to this building. I'm not a slave to this church, so to speak. I'm talking the building and the... I'm not. I'm, I'm a slave to him. Now, the reason it's like it is, is he is preparing us to be a church during the millennial reign. That's why we are so different that's why we, some of y'all, we can read this and you get it and others don't. Because the ones that get it are going to be this church in the millennial reign. Now let me explain that to you. In the millennial reign, when Christ comes back, there are going to be some people still in their natural body. Now we'll be changed. We'll have our glorified body. That's a body that's going to feel good and the joints won't hurt. and you know. But there's going to be people still in their natural body. Now, many of these might be, say, let's, I'll give you an example. Say children, that their parents never took the mark of the beast. They're going to be there. God ain't casting children into hell. Maybe if their parents even took the mark of the beast, he ain't going to cast the children into hell, you see? Now, after a thousand years, Satan is let loose. Now, why didn't God just destroy Satan then? He locks him and chains him up for a thousand years. Because when he lets them loose, they're going to have to face the temptation of sin and decide whom they're going to choose. As for me and my house, we choose the Lord. They have never had that, see? They've never had that temptation, many of them. And there's going to be uh, 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 children born during the millennial reign. So during the millennial reign, these people, and a lot of them ministers are going to be these children that we get. And I, I, get, I see these prophecies. I tell them all their gifts. And I think, well, Lord, if you're getting ready to come... This person's still going to be a child or a young adult or something. Yeah, in the millennial reign, ministering for the king. 
So the church that will be there during the 1,000 year period of the millennial reign will be the perfect church that God set up to win these people. They'll be taught, they'll be brought in, just like some of the things I explained to you. I don't know everything, so don't get me wrong. There's going to be stuff that more that's going to happen that I don't, he hasn't shared with me yet. And then when Satan is released, you've got to remember, during the millennial reign, there'll be no death. These children will be 1,000 years old. They'll grow up, I mean, you know. But then Satan's released, and they have the choice to choose to go sin or choose God. But through God's teaching, most, if not all of them, will have seen the truth. Now, you say, well, why, why are we doing that? Why is Satan loosed and all that? Because the children of Israel who saw Moses do all them miracles, God part the Red Sea for them, all them miracles, yet they still went into disobedience and rebellion. Now we think, well, if I'd have seen them part the Red Sea and <clears throat> if I'd have seen uh, all the, the plagues come down on, on Egypt and all these things Moses did, I would have stayed a believer. No, you wouldn't have. Most of us probably wouldn't. Some of us might have. Same thing's going to apply to those during the millennial reign. They're going to have to see the gospel, know the gospel, understand the gospel, and then accept it. And when Satan's loose, they, either, they don't want nothing to do with him. They, and they will see the miracles. They'll see the things in the millennial reign. Let me give you a picture God just gave me. Suppose this church, the apostles are going to head up this church. It's not just, it's the church in general throughout the world during the millennial reign, but there will be different local bodies, local bodies of, of Christ all throughout the world. And Christ will rule from Jerusalem. I mean, it's going to be awesome because we're going to, the technology we're going to have, you're going to ask me, who's preaching today? I say, same one that preached last Sunday. Just turn it on, folks. Click. And there's the King of Kings speaking to you from Jerusalem. That's the technology I have. Now, this all sounds like a pipe dream to some of y'all. And y'all say, woo, that sounds a little weird for me. All right, just wait and see. Because when God spoke this to me, that's what this whole message was about. This whole message came prophetically as he's speaking to me. We are the church of the millennial reign. That now tells me that I don't care. If, if people don't come in and they don't like what the truth is, I can't change it. I won't change it because I'm in preparation. Now, he also explained to me the crowns. Those who are in the church of the millennial reign say we're, let's say we're on the mountain. We'll just stay here for a minute. Say our church is on the mountain during the millennial reign. We will be invited to worship the king in Jerusalem and we will throw our crowns before his feet. That's scriptural. Now you think, why would we do that? Well, the crowns represent you being a part of the millennial reign with being a church in the millennial reign and the crowns you throw down in your faith uh, are, are your, uh, how the Lord explain it to you? That's your calling card. That's who you are. Look at him. You know, you're not going to be carrying these heavy crowns that's going to make your neck sore. I'm not talking about, these are crowns that people see. That's why he talks about my name will be written on you. These are things that we, in the spirit realm, they'll see these things. You will have no problem getting an audience with the king if you're wearing his crowns. Think about it. See, this is a whole new world than we've ever seen. We've never seen a world like this because we were born into sin. All we've seen is the world we see now. Sometimes it's better than at other times, and now we're at the worst time I've ever seen it in my life. The Lord's getting ready to come. The United States is under judgment. It's called the Shemitah judgment, in case you're wondering. And we are getting ready to, sorry folks, it's getting ready to crash and burn. <laughs> now, I look at that as like, that does, that's no reason not to pray for the United States. But if it's time for the Lord to come, he comes at a time when everything is falling apart except his beloved church. And some of us may be martyred, but most of us are not because he has to protect us if we're obedient to his word. So while everything's falling down around us and the economic system is going to go down, I mean, you can't be $20 uh, trillion dollars in, in, in debt and get out overnight. And when you see the other countries that now have a piece of the United States, the United States as we know it today will not exist unless the Lord comes quickly. And he is coming quickly. He's not coming in decades. He's coming in weeks, months, and years. That's it. We are here, folks. I keep telling you that. It is time. 
and you're going to see this change and you're going to live during the millennial reign. Now you think, God could just, why does it take a thousand years to rebuild the earth? Because you think, God, he can just speak in existence. Sure he can, but you're his joint heirs. You're expected to do certain things. We're going to build it. Carpenters are going to build houses again. The only difference is they ain't going to get hurt with nail guns or all this. You understand? And the reason it's going to take a thousand years is it's going to be, now some of it's already built, the new Jerusalem coming down. But the reason it's going to take that long is because we're going to do it ourselves because everything's going to be destroyed. And it's like starting from scratch. And that's the way God wants it and that's the way it'll happen. Meanwhile, the, the uh, Millennial Reign Church, which will be one of them, will be preaching the truth. So you aren't going to get me to change anything in here. You aren't going to get me to water down anything to get people through the door because I don't work for them. I work for him. And if he says this is what you're supposed to teach no matter uh, who comes through the door, then that's what you teach. And that's what I'm doing. Let me um, keep move on here then. I was just thinking if the Lord had anything to... to uh, one more thing he's told me. Okay. Some of y'all may have wondered why uh, Paul here has this certain sound. It's called the tabernacle sound. Some people come in and they're not used to it. They've never heard it. They're used to some of their other songs, and that's okay. There's some other songs I like. I mean, Paul can sing How Great Thou Art, and I get chill bumps, you know, or Amazing Grace or something. That's the tabernacle sound. Think about it. That's the Millennial Kingdom tabernacle sound. Are you getting the depth of this? We have been chosen to do that. Paul doesn't know why he writes these things. I mean, they come so quick. I mean, he'll have a song in a, in a day or two. And, he's, and I think, man, that'd take me a, probably five years to write that. It's because God is preparing the tabernacle sound, the tabernacle of David. It's right back on the wall. See, that's not for now. That's for the millennial reign. So that means if it's for the millennial reign, the millennial reign is right around the corner, folks. He's getting ready to come. So when you hear Paul Dietrich play his tabernacle sound, you've got to understand that's going to be played by orchestras. It's going to be have the angelic choir singing with him during the millennial, millennial reign, and it's going to be more awesome than I can even imagine. And I've heard some of the greatest orchestras in the world being a professional musician. The tabernacle sound. All right, Lord, I'm through. Now, concerning salvation, true apostolic ministry says this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But you can, can't believe in him until you know him. He even said that, depart from me, I never knew you. That means you never knew me. Apostolic ministry also says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. But you can't confess with your mouth or believe in your heart until you know what to confess and what to believe. Apostolic ministry also says this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But you can't make the decision to be truly born again until you know what you're being born into. Read it. Nicodemus, what do you mean? Born again. You can only come out of a, your mother's womb one time. Born again. For closing scripture, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And this passage will sum it all up for you. Now, when y'all come into church, I want you to try to get this in your spirit. You are preparing to be a part of the Millennial Kingdom Church and nothing but. It doesn't mean you shouldn't invite people and get them saved, whatever, delivered, whatever. We're still going to do what we've been doing. That is our primary purpose. That is our priority. We are in preparation for Jesus to come any day now, and then we're going to have a church bigger than you can imagine. It's his church, by the way. It ain't mine. It's his. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, speaking to the church in Corinth. So, therefore, he's speaking to us. Look at verse 1, 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declared unto you the gospel, so he declared the gospel, which I preached unto you, so he preached the gospel, 
which also you have received, they received it, and wherein you stand, that means they're living in it, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. What the Apostle Paul is saying here is that in order to be truly saved, the gospel has to be declared, preached, received, and lived. Otherwise, you believed in vain. Close your Bibles and let's pray. Oh, thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word, for your word is truth, and we know your word is truth. Lord Jesus, your word is you. You are in print. Thank you, Father, for your word. And Father, we just thank you for the things you've revealed, the things you're leading us into. Sometimes, Father, it doesn't look great, but it is great. It's great because your presence is here. It's great because you have ordained us to do what you've called us to do, not what anybody else has called us to do, but what you've called us to do. And Father, we ask for the strength, the courage, the anointing, the finances, everything we need, Father, to continue to expand your kingdom until the day you arrive and set foot on the earth to set up your millennial reign or until the day we're raptured out of here and we come back with you to set up the millennial reign, Father. And we just thank you for all the gifts and callings, everything, Father, you have given us, Father. We thank you, Father, for the season of uh, Rosh Hashanah, the season of Yom Kippur and the uh, Feast of Tabernacles that's coming up. And we thank you, Father, that you've allowed us to understand these, even though we're Gentiles. We thank you, Father, that we can understand it because we are part of the one new man, the one new man which consists of both Jew and Gentile. The Jews will know what the Gentiles can do, and the Gentiles will know what the Jews can do. And we thank you, Father, for that one new man that comes together for all eternity. And we ask it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua, the Messiah, Jesus, the King of Kings, and all in agreement said, Amen. Thank you. Hi, my name is Apostle Terry Dunn, and I want to tell you about today's incredible ministry offer. In my hand, I'm holding one of the most life-changing books you could ever read. It's Pastor Gene Moody's Red Cover Deliverance Manual, and it contains everything you'll ever need to know about the ministry of deliverance. This 300 plus page manual will answer questions like, can Christians have demons? Is there really such a thing as demon possession? Is drugs, alcohol, pornography, and other addictions caused by demons? Is there really such a thing as generational curses? And the list goes on and on. As an easy to read, hands-on instructional manual, it's a must for every Christian to own and every pastor to have on hand as part of his or her personal library. To request your personal copy of Pastor Gene Moody's 300 page plus deliverance manual, simply send a ministry gift of $50 to the address on your screen. That address is the Apostolic Hour, Post Office Box 1111, Mont Eagle, Tennessee, 37356 or you can go to our website at www.tdworldministries.org In addition if you order today as a special bonus I also include a free copy of my newest deliverance CD entitled Drive Through Deliverance. By listening to this easy to understand 60 minute deliverance program and by following its instructions, you, your family, your friends, or anyone else who listens to it will have the opportunity to set themselves free from any and all satanic and demonic bondages. That's both the manual and the CD for a one-time ministry gift of only $50. Don't delay. Order now while supplies last. For a ministry gift of $50, you'll receive your own personal copy of Pastor Gene Moody's 300-plus page Deliverance Manual, along with a free copy of Terry Dunn's Deliverance CD entitled drive Through Deliverance. That address again is the Apostolic Hour, Post Office Box 1111, Mont Eagle, Tennessee, 37356 or you can order online at www.tdworldministries.org. It's everything you ever wanted to know about demons and devils, but were afraid to ask. Righteousness being restored. 
And though these are days of great trial Of famine and darkness and sore Still we are the voice in the desert Crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord concludes this week's broadcast of the Apostolic Hour, live from the Mountain of God Tabernacle, 331 King Street in Mon Eagle, Tennessee. On behalf of our congregation and ministry team, I want to personally thank you for joining us today as we hope you'll join us next week at the same day, time, and station for another apostolic teaching of God's Word. I'd also like to cordially invite you to attend our Sunday church worship services at 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. and our Friday night Shabbat service at 7 p.m. For ministry bookings of any member of the Apostolic Hour ministry team, please contact us by writing to the address on your screen. The Apostolic Hour, Post Office Box 1111, Mont Eagle, Tennessee, 37356. Or visit our website at www.tdworldministries.org From all of us here at the Mountain of God Tabernacle, we thank you for being with us, and may you have a blessed day in the Lord Jesus Christ. The